My name is Neil Crilly. I'm the West Regional Director for the Recording Academy. Uh, I want to welcome you to our Entertainment Law Initiative uh, Writing Competition Info Session. Um, this is an event that we've run for many years, around 20 years at the Recording Academy, and we're thrilled to be able to present a webinar this year to everyone that could join us today nationwide. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be available through the rest of December. So I have been producing the uh, Entertainment Law Initiative for the last uh, four or five years with my colleagues in my, in my region, uh, Jessica Pickett, uh, Luke Savage and Patricia Redia, give a shout out to them. And um, I'm joined today by uh, both some fellow, uh, some members of our uh, Entertainment Law exec Executive Committee, and also a couple of past winners of the competition. Um, so just, we'll give you some basics later, but I wanna point out right away that you can learn all the information about this event at grammy.com slash ELI. Um, there you'll find the rules, the deadline dates, uh, some social graphics, and we'd love if you could share information about the competition. Um, so let's introduce uh, all of the folks that are going to join us today so they can say hello. We've got um, the chair of our ELI executive community, Soriano, who's a music lawyer and partner at King Holmes, Paterno, and Soriano. If you want to say hello, Lori. Hi, yes, I'm Lori Soriano. I'm a partner at King Holmes, Paterno and Soriano. I am a transactional music lawyer. I represent a lot of recording artists, songwriters, um, producers, other creatives in the music business, and um, a lot of small uh, companies, music publishers, and small record labels. Great. Welcome Thanks. to the, the event. Yeah. Uh, next up, I want to introduce Ken Abdo. He's on the ELI Executive Committee also, and he's uh, been our writing competition program chair since the beginning, actually. And he's an entertainment lawyer and partner at Fox Rothschilds LLP. Hello, everyone. Ken Abdo, uh, communicating from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have been involved in this program for many years uh, and uh, have actually presented awards to most of the finalists and and, and uh, runner-ups as well. Over the years, I am a uh, partner at the law firm of Fox Rothschild. We are a large firm of about a thousand lawyers in 27 cities across the United States uh, with an entertainment department of about 25 full-time entertainment lawyers. I am a transactional music lawyer, as is Lori, and um, I am very pleased to be once again involved and welcome you with encouragement, giving you encouragement to indeed participate in the contest this year. Great, thanks, Ken. So next I wanna introduce a couple of students who are joining us, or former students is the best way to put it, but we knew them as students when they became uh, winners and runners up of the uh, writing competition the last couple of years. So first up, Asha Maduker, who is our ELI Writing Competition 2019 student runner-up, and she's now a graduated and is a music attorney at Council LLP. You want to say hello, Asha? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, as Neil said, I'm a music attorney at Council LLP based in San Francisco, currently quarantining in South Florida in the sun. Um, grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks. And finally, uh, Christopher Chiang, who is our winner from 2020, from earlier this year. Um, he's a recent UCLA uh, law school graduate and a first year associate planned at, Mi at Mitchell Men and Robinson. You wanna say hello, Christopher? Yes, hi, thank you for having me. My name is Christopher Chiang. I'm a recent UCLA law grad and I will be a first year associate at uh, Michael Men and Robinson's Los Angeles office. I'm so happy to be here. Terrific. All right, so now we've got our group together. I do want to make one other quick announcement before I turn it over to Lori for some comments. Um, and that is to thank uh, Fox Rothschild LLP for their support of the scholarships that we'll be uh, awarding in the competition this year. So we'll get into uh, the rules information and some, some from our past winners uh, shortly, but let me turn it over to Lori. So I just wanna say um, again, welcome to all of you law students, um, those who know a lot about the music industry and those who whose first foray into the music industry is this actual um, 
Zoom. Um, uh, we welcome you with open arms and uh, I really, I and the rest of the ELI uh, executive committee encourage all of you to participate in this um, really wonderful competition. Um, we'd love to have law students from every law school in the country. Um, and we're gonna try to make this as easy as possible to, to show you how to do it and that it's really a, a worthwhile thing to do. I mean, it'll help you gain entree into the music industry and the entertainment industry. Um, I'd say most music lawyers in the country are involved with ELI on some level, either attending or, or participating um, in some way. And um, we really want to have as many law students as possible get involved with us. Um, so obviously the entree is the first thing. Um, in addition, the winners of the competition receive scholarship money. Neil will get into the details on that. Um, the winners also will be provided with mentoring sessions. Um, so you see that winner gets $10,000. The two runners up receive $2,500. Um, then there would be a, a one hour mentoring session with a member of the, the executive committee, which I'm on and um, Ken is on. So it'll be you know, among the top music lawyers in the country who will just set everything aside to just help the, the winners you know, understand the right path to achieve their goals in the music business. Um, in addition to these prizes, um, the winner of the competition has his or her paper published in the ABA journal, The Entertainment and Sports Lawyer. So practitioners all over the country in entertainment and sports law will be seeing the winner's paper, which is incredible, just as a way, again, for people to know about you and your skills. Um, by the way, the ABA is an official co-sponsor of the ELI writing competition. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge and thank them for their involvement and uh, reiterate um, Neil's thank you to Fox Rothschild for uh, uh, providing the money for the scholarships. Um, another um, way for young um, aspiring music law practitioners to get involved in the music business is by joining Grammy U, which is um, set up for college and graduate students to have seminars and uh, other programming, internships, et cetera, uh, in the music business. Um, it's very simple. You just uh, pay $50 to join, and that single fee keeps you a member for all your years in law school through graduation, plus an additional two years. And the details on that are at Grammy.com. Um, so those are the basics. I, again, couldn't encourage you more to participate. We've had some wonderful papers um, and it really has helped educate us practitioners in some of the cutting edge issues that we should be aware of. So it's, it's really very valuable on all, on all sides. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Neil and Ken who will go through the details on the competition. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, so this competition is open to JD LLM or JD LLM joint candidates enrolled at any US law school. Um, I wanna point out that both ABA accredited and non ABA accredited uh, law school students can enter for regardless of which they're attending. Um, you, you must be enrolled as a student as of January 1st, 2021. So you have to be a current student in order to enter the competition. Um, of course, our previous winners or finalists are ineligible. And the basics of the competition, and Ken will get into some, some discussion about topics, choosing a topic and that kind of thing in a moment, but uh, papers can be no longer than 3,000 words in which that excludes endnotes and footnotes. Um, you must use the blue book, a universe, uniform system of citation for citation style. Most law students will be familiar with that. And please do pay attention to our specific requirements regarding font, font size, and so on that are in the rules. We found over time that it was very helpful for students to have the holiday break to be able to write their paper. So we did make the deadline January 4th this year, 2021, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Please do pay attention to the, uh, you know, the time of the deadline in your time zone. And also, please, every year we have to disqualify a paper that's received late. Uh, and we really hate to do that. So please, you know, treat it like uh, a project that's due in law school or at court or whatever, whatever in the future, what, whatever, uh, but please, please adhere to that deadline. 
Um, we will be letting the winners know on January 15th that they've been selected and they will be honored as mentioned at our January 29th uh, ELI program. Um, normally this is an event held it, uh, live during Grammy week. It will be held again this year live, uh, uh, well, during Grammy week, but not quite as live as it usually is. We'll be doing it online. The silver lining to that is that all students nationwide will be able to attend that event for free this year from wherever they are. So we look forward to uh, you joining us there. Um, so uh, once again, I would mention that uh, Fox Roth Child LLP supported our writing competition scholarships and, and Lori went through those prizes with you. It's just notable that the, the, the scholarships are paid uh, to the law school on behalf of the student winners uh, so that it, it really does help them, we hope. And, uh, um, but it isn't a cash sponsorship that goes to the student. Um, so there's, uh, like I said, these rules, all submission deadlines, rules, and so forth are at uh, ELI, uh, our ELI page on Grammy.com. So it's Grammy.com slash ELI. Um, we um, all have a downloadable PDF there of the rules. So the other thing I want to talk about is the grading of the papers. So we try to create, we created a very fair process that involves a blind two grader process. We have approximately 40 practicing attorneys and attorneys in academia who have volunteered to grade these papers. Each paper is stripped of the name of the student, the institution that they attend as well, and they're graded by two different attorney graders who don't know that they're both grading the same paper. Um, the scores are average to set the student score. Then we take the top 10 and then we do a second round of grading also with a two attorney grader blind uh, scoring process. Um, so it doesn't matter where you go to school, anything about your background, it's all based on, of course, the content of that paper. Um, so I talked about the, uh, the event on January 29th. Um, at that event, we will be honoring our our competition winners. Um, we will be also honoring the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association this year as an organization. It's actually their 40th anniversary. We're honoring them for all the work that they've done um, and to uh, reach out to uh, diverse communities and so forth. Um, also, we will be presenting a panel uh, uh, discussion that should be interesting for anyone studying music law or, or practicing attorneys you should also note that we have uh, for years now enjoyed the support of major law firms in music law, um, right, all the record labels, digital services, Apple, Spotify, and so forth, who attended this event. We, we have many of them who are continuing to sponsor the event this year and will be present at the, uh, at the online event. So we really do hope you can join us. So, as I mentioned, Ken has uh, Ken Abdo has been uh, involved with this writing competition for many, many years, and I want to turn it over to him to talk more about uh, grading details and, and topic selection and more. Thank you, Neil. I'm uh, again happy to go through the what I hope are encouraging uh, comments to make sure that you all are uh, comfortable about getting into this competition. Um, encourage is my theme, or courage. I know this is a very uh, challenging time to write a, a, a paper right in the middle of law school and probably on your break. Um, but uh, we, we really want you to uh, enjoy the process. Um, there is uh, no grade, as you know, and this is all extracurricular, and this is uh, supposed to be uh, perhaps a, a detour from your usual academics. Okay, all essays must be original works. They have to be specifically written for the contest. Previous published works are ineligible. The, the submission of works previously written for academic purposes are eligible as long as they otherwise adhere to the writing rules. So for sure, please read the rules and uh, read them thoroughly. You're all upstanding readers with high comprehension levels and you don't wanna miss something or get disqualified for some uh, you know, unfortunate reason. So please read those rules. Um, also, uh, the uh, co authors also co-authorship is not allowed. This has got to be a sedentary uh, authorship. 
So uh, no co-authorship, please. No ghost writers, please. Uh, papers may be reviewed by law school faculty or colleagues for editorial feedback, um, but such assistance must, must not rise to the level of co-authorship. Uh, my recommendation is that you give it to someone who actually understands what you're writing about, um, probably a lawyer, uh, maybe someone who's uh, in the music industry side of things, if you know that person, just to get a feedback that they actually understand what you're saying. They actually un understand what you're writing about. And if they don't understand it, maybe they can ask questions that would help you clarify your language. Um, the clarity, here's the, here's the judging criteria. The clarity of expression, which includes organization, spelling and grammar. Um, we were joking earlier that typos are a no-no. Look, look out for those uh, because they can just kind of subtly prejudice the graders if there's grammar problems, typo problems, and so forth. Uh, it's time to think back on your English composition class to make sure things is, is as it should be. Um, although it's not like we're looking for English papers here, we're just looking for papers that are easy to understand. Um, the depth of analysis, um, oh, for, before that, the originality of thought, the uniqueness of topic, to me is a, a big one. Um, you shouldn't be beating a dead horse, something that's been out there for a long time. You know, a topic in music that is no longer, you know, fresh. Uh, avoid those. Look for something that is really unique and rare and maybe not known. I mean, the more you know about something that the graders might not know, the more interested they're going to be in what you're writing about. So it's almost better to find an obscure, not ridiculous, but an obscure uh, relevant topic and go into that rather than try to show these knowledgeable music lawyers uh, that you know something about a topic that everyone knows about that they don't or something like that. So um, uniqueness, freshness. Uh, the depth of analysis. All right, this is not a law review article or a case note. We're not asking for you to footnote like crazy. I think that you want to be very judicious about your analysis. As we say in the music business, don't bore us, get to the chorus, uh, and don't worry about the setup so much, you know, make that crisp and get to your point. You don't have a lot of words. Uh, you, this, this, this thing will fill up quickly if you've got your thoughts lined up. Again, when you use authority, make sure it's the right authority and it's good authority. No People Magazine, if you can avoid it. No secondary or third uh, or online top authorities. You know, let's try to be authoritative and let's uh, don't need a lot of them. Just, you know, a, a very, very uh, judicious use of authority just to make sure that what you're saying that might be fact checkable, you can actually support that. Um, the relevance to the industry is, again, a really important one to me. Um, there is a need for you to display that you are thinking proactively. You are thinking uh, in a way that you identify a relevant topic in the industry and that you are educating or edifying uh, the graders on exactly why this is a problem and how it can be resolved. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that in recent years, there's a lot of interesting articles on technology. There's technologies out there that some of the graders might not be aware of. Some of it is because um, the law students generally tend to be younger people, and they're, they're really more aware of some of the more cutting-edge technologies out there. And you can be edifying as well as identifying a problem as well as rectifying that problem. So um, edifying resolving, rectifying, I like that. So uh, think along those lines. The essay uh, requirements, again, please make sure they conform. Uh, we don't want you to get booted out on a technicality. I think, Neil, here you had uh, asked that we might give some uh, topic selections or some suggestions on, on where you might take your writing. Um, I think I've commented on making sure it's novel, uh, making sure that it's something that you uh, I like. I think if your enthusiasm for the, for the topic is evident in your writing, it, it can be infectious. It can, be, uh, it can draw the reader in. Use those powerful words. Use those 
you know, words that you can't use around many other uh, individuals, 10 point words, and to make a good uh, hard comment about uh, how you feel about a topic. Um, if you're excited about the topic and you use concomitant language to display your enthusiasm, I think that that good writing attitude can be very, uh, very persuasive along with the substance of what you're writing about. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, so I wanted to uh, move over to um, Lori, who is going to talk with one of our students, uh, Christopher, about uh, his paper and his experience. Okay. So, uh, so let's get into it. Um, you are the winner uh, this, of the past, this past year's competition, um, which is a, quite an honor. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. So can you maybe share with the law students that are watching um, the process by which you, know, you found out about and, and started um, on your way to winning the competition? Sure, How did you find yeah. Out? Uh, about this competition? Yeah. I, um, I actually applied in my first year of law school already. I had heard about it through my school, my professors. I had an entertainment professor, Susan Aikens at UCLA, who pointed out this, um, uh, this process. So I had applied for it, um, submitted it, you know, as a 1L and uh, did not win, but it, le it led uh, a great foundation to prepare myself to submit this year uh, in my third year of law school. And so, and then by that time, I had also taken music law with Professor Jenko at UCLA and, uh, uh, and it really prepared me for um, submitting for, my, for this essay competition. Um, and then why don't you tell uh, everybody what your topic was and how you went about selecting that topic? Sure. So um, I, I think I had stated, stated that I had also taken copyright law with Professor Netnol and he, at UCLA, and he had also, I then took a seminar that um, examined law and innovation space. And having a background in uh, entertainment law and being very interested in um, the entertainment industry and the music industry, I started thinking about, okay, what kind of topic um, is current? And I was getting very frustrated at the amount of copyright infringement lawsuits that were coming out. You know, of course, in my music law class, we had studied the Blurred Lines case with Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke versus the Marvin Gaye estate, very famous case. Um, the Led Zeppelin case, of course, very famous as well. Uh, and then uh, on my own research, and I most likely probably read it in my musical class as well, um, the Katy Perry case with Dark Horse. But um, the, the last year that came up, what really made me think about it was, I think, Seven Rings by Ariana Grande was getting sued for copyright infringement. Shallow by Lady Gaga was getting sued for copyright infringement. Ed Sheeran was getting sued for copyright infringement on multiple songs. Um, it just seemed like a very important topic. And to me, it seemed like it's clear that there is a legal um, ambiguity here that is way too permissive in allowing all these copyright infringement lawsuits. And so that's kind of how I got my idea and started doing my research. Um, my topic proposes a new legal framework for copyright infringement cases. It proposes, right now, the Ninth Circuit views music, um, musical works, under a broad protection, which means they must be substantially similar. And my argument is that music should be on a sliding scale from broad to thin, thin being uh, um, virtually identical. And uh, I had to come through that to that conclusion doing a lot of research. So I, I recommend any student who wants to do this, take the time to do the research. Um, for me, I had to do a lot of research on, you know, what do you musicologists and what do musicians uh, view their musical work as. And that's how I parsed out their primary elements um, that form a backbone of a music composition, melody, harmony, rhythm, and secondary elements that enhance it. And using those elements, we can slide from broad to thin depending on what is being copied. Okay, so um, did, could you tell us how long from start to finish you would say this took and maybe recommending what yeah students what students should do um i think that um i, I you know i am lucky that I, I go to ucla i took a music law class entertainment law class so I, I had done a lot of this reading before um i would say all in all it probably took me about like a month uh, a couple maybe a, a, mo a month and a couple weeks 
Um, of course, I was doing school at the time, but I was doing a lot of reading and reading and reading. I suggest students don't don't just start writing your paper and think like, oh, I'll get to my conclusion. I had to do a lot of research um, separate from just the law about music and how musicians think in order to formulate my paper properly. The writing process, definitely like a couple weeks. And then, I mean, as, as you mentioned, I think deadline this year is January 4th. I basically finished my finals and then just continued writing into my winter break. Um, I, I still enjoyed my winter break. Um, but if you don't take the time to prepare, you might be cramming your winter break. <laughs> you know, doing this paper was really great as well. Um, it really opened up a lot of opportunities um, to research this and going, winning this first place prize was obviously an uh, incredible opportunity. You know, the scholarship money, fantastic. Getting published in the ABA Law Journal, uh, amazing. Um, you also get to go to the Grammys and the Music Cares Gala, as well as the Grammy uh, Entertainment Law Initiative event. Um, and all of those are amazing. I think the Music Cares Gala, we, um, Steven Tyler performed last year and getting to see Steven Tyler, you know, it's a, it's a industry kind of event. And he was like, you guys are so professional, come up to the stage. And so it was exciting to kind of rush to the stage and see Steven Tyler perform it, was, it felt really historic in a way. And then of course the Grammys were great um, because you know Demi Lovato was amazing last year and Camila Cabello performed uh, amazing as well. And, um, and then of course the networking opportunities that you get from the um, Grammy Entertainment Law Initiative event. I in fact then got to meet um, Professor Ange Angeline Chang and got to present my paper and do more research on the topic um, as the Katy Perry case and the Led Zeppelin case have, have since, my, since I submitted a paper had official court decisions come out. And I got to present my paper at the Cleveland School of Law. So that was um, a great you know, opportunity to continue learning uh, on a subject that I'm very passionate about, very interested in. But could you just summarize um, like whether you felt that it was a, this was a valuable experience and, and in what ways has this been valuable in sort of setting you on your career path? Yeah, absolutely. It was an incredibly valuable experience. I mean, this was a subject area that I think a lot of people are interested in. It was fascinating to read musicologists and musicians and legal opinions as well about how they understand music um, and how they understand it fitting in with the legal framework, um, especially researching cases. You know, I founded my paper on, um, I focused my paper on the Katy Perry case, Dark Horse, and the Led Zeppelin, and of course, their lines, the seminal case that had to be discussed. And since then, the Led Zeppelin case has been updated, and I had proposed um, overturning the inverse racial rule, which the court did, in fact, do uh, back in March. And the Katy Perry case, of course, you know, while not aligning with my um, kind of unique proposal for a sliding scale, does recognize, you know, hey, these rhythms are repeating this ostinato, um, very familiar in the beginning of Dark Horse, no, 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 is not wholly original enough to deserve copyright infringement protection to the degree that the Joyful Noise team was seeking. Um, and yeah, it, it really was a great exercise um, in, in an area that I'm interested in, a great networking opportunity. Um, I've learned so much. I've got to speak with, with you guys and, um, you know, other amazing attorneys. So I cannot okay. recommend it more highly. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'll pass it along to Ken uh, to talk to Asha about her participation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, Asha, good to see you again. Um, we're not in sunny California, but we are here. And we're going to talk about your, your experience. First off, um, could you tell us how did you learn about the competition? Yeah, I was a Grammy U intern in undergrad, so I kind of already been connected to the Recording Academy and the services and resources that it provided. Um, and when I got into law school and decided to pursue that path to be an attorney, um, I was very focused on wanting to be a music attorney. And so had heard about this competition, um, just kind of on the fringes, being involved with the Recording Academy, knew that it was something I definitely wanted to submit for. Let's uh, talk about what you actually selected. Uh, what was your topic? 
Yeah, my topic was about the Music Modernization Act. Um, my year when I was writing it was 2018. So I was kind of sk skating on thin ice because um, mm -hmm. technically the bill had not been passed um, when I started writing my paper, but I was just kind of crossing my fingers that it would. I thought it was a really strong bill um, and law. And, and so I started to, my interest started to peak because I'm a songwriter and it was really doing a lot for songwriters through the MLC and being able to collect mechanical royalties and, and the moves that it was making. But the prompt that you guys had given us was to find a problem within the music industry and propose a solution. And so as I started to research and dig deeper and deeper, I started to notice that um, there is quite a large uh, gap as far as sound recording um, rights and protections um, and the royalty payout for it when it uh, relates to terrestrial radio. And so that's kind of what became the focus of my paper. It goes through um, a lengthy, semi-lengthy, uh, in-depth discussion about the evolution of sound recording rights that I know is super interesting to everybody and uh, went into why terrestrial radio doesn't pay public performance royalties for sound recordings and proposed solutions on why they should or, or how that could happen. So what you did is you just went through a litany of sophisticated language and words and references to the industry that are probably a lot of students have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> other than royalties and recording and a couple other words. But see, at the end of it all, you became quite versed and, and very articulate about those concepts and about those words. So um, I, that's definitely uh, that's definitely a benefit of going to this research is you actually learn a lot about the substantive areas of law and the business uh, as well. Um, but I did want to ask you, when you were in the throes of writing this, um, was there a point where you went, I don't, I, I think I want to bail on this. This is getting too difficult. I'm, I'm lost in the weeds. I'll never win. Um, did you have any moments uh, in that, in, in your, in your writing experience like that? Yeah, quite. I mean, the first was I didn't know if the law was going to pass. So I was writing about something that might not even exist. Um, so that was a little terrifying to put in all this time and, and effort towards that. Um, the second was I had gotten maybe through three fourths of my paper and uh, I happened to be studying abroad at the time and didn't have access to internet all the time. And so I wasn't backing up my paper to cloud or Google Drive. Um, obviously I was saving it, but uh, I had a little mishap and lost my laptop and had to basically restart my entire paper um, in November and, and, and a lot of my research. Um, thankfully, I was super in the weeds in it. Um, sorry for maybe uh, being a little too in the weeds when explaining it, but um, you know that, that was definitely a point where I was like, oh my God, is this worth it? But it definitely was. And uh, I'm really glad that I, I was able to pull it together and, and be a part of this. Oh yeah, well, no apology necessary. I was complimenting you on the way you were able to uh... To, to you know, recall and re recite what you wrote about. I have to say though, take, choosing that topic was a little bit of, of hail mary pass. I mean, it, if that if that law did not pass, in in your in your making your uh, article potentially moot, um, that that's a little risky. I would have to say, if you did that, I think the graders would probably still not would not uh, take off points. You know, for for going after a topic. That could very well be very relevant um, and maybe doesn't turn out to be, but in your case, it did. Um, this is same um, with, the, with Christopher's article. Uh, infringement is certainly nothing new. It's been around for a long time, but to, to take on a way to resolve um, and to standardize a way of looking at an infringement suit and the elements and how to resolve it, I think was, was also a, you know, a, a heavy task. So those are great topics, both of them, in terms of being relevant um, to what's going on and coming up with a solution. All right, um, give us some highlights of your experience during Grammy week, uh, things that you remember and, and uh, that'll be indelibly etched in your memory. <laughs> um, yeah, so I attended the luncheon. Every year the Recording Academy has a luncheon for specifically entertainment attorneys. It's called, um, I guess, the Entertainment Law Initiative. Is that the specific title for it? Okay. Um, it was intimidating and exhilarating all at the same time. I'm a bit of a music nerd, so I definitely knew a lot of the people there, um, but had not, not necessarily put a face to a name. Um, I think one of the big things that I'll, I'll, I'll always remember, if you've ever taken a music class of any kind, uh, you know the music industry Bible. 
and that's um, All You Need to Know About the Music Business by Don Passman. And he was sitting at my table, like directly across from me. Um, and so I obviously went up and said hello and, and thanked him for that book and for what he's contributed to the music industry. Um, and he was so kind and he actually uh, still keeps in touch with me, um, invited me to the firm to meet some attorneys there. Um, it was just incredibly kind. And this is somebody that I, I had known about you know, since high school, reading that book, there's so many editions out there and, um, you know, he's contributed a lot. So being at at the luncheon and, and being able to make that connection was, you know, one memory I'll, I'll, over, I'll take for me for the rest of my life because, you know, Mr. Passman is a legend. Um, and then the second was meeting my current employer. Um, I went into the luncheon really not knowing a lot of people and just, you know, doing your thing as you always do as a student to network and try and, and shine and be somewhat interesting. Um, and, and I got very lucky in meeting my employer. Um, uh, the firm is called Council LLP. It's a boutique entertainment firm. We do talent representation just like you can and Lori. Um, and, you know, just for that moment, I will always be thankful because I have a job and I'm pursuing something that I'm very passionate about and that I love. So um, as you look back on your experience, if you didn't win, would you have regretted participating? No. Um, you know, I, I'm a songwriter and the MMA was doing a lot of things for songwriters. So I was already very invested um, and obsessed with this and what they were doing. Um, so I, I wanted to know what this was about and what the changes were going to be because it was going to affect me, it was going to affect my friends, um, a lot of the people that I know and, and that I work with. So no, I, I wanted to learn about this, whether or not I was going to write the paper. I wanted to make a comment that, because um, you've alluded to it several times that you you know are in the music business, you are a songwriter, uh, you, you have a, a knowledge of the music business. Um, I believe you had some work background in the music business. And, uh, but in order to win this contest, you don't need to be um, you know, as involved in the music business uh, as Asha, certainly um, the sophistication that you bring from your life experience and your, your observation of the music industry, no matter what your background is what counts. Um, I've also known you know, through my practice, um, especially because it was founded in the Midwest, that talent comes from everywhere. It's not born on the coast and it's certainly not born into the industry. So that the, all you folks out there, whether you're in Sheboygan, Wisconsin or wherever, you know, understand that talent comes from everywhere. And we have winners that, that have, are, are really quite geographically diverse and diverse as, as well as diverse in other ways. So um, uh, don't feel like you're- yeah. I'll, I'll add to that is that I agree with you. You don't need necessarily need the background experience, but you do need the dedication. Um, I'm a first generation American. I'm the first attorney and over 30 plus grandkids that decided to go to law school to figure out I'm the only person in my family that works in the music business. So it's not, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't run in the family. My dad doesn't work at a record label. Um, the, the music industry and music itself is something that I love and I truly am so very passionate about. And it's through that drive of wanting to understand the business that everything else kind of falls into place. So while you don't necessarily need to have, you know, years of experience, if if this is what you love and you pick a topic that you truly are genuine about and want to know about, I think that's really good. What's going to speak in your paper. And I think that's what attorneys look at of, oh, okay, this person is passionate about this and they see a problem and they want to find a solution. So I think that's what I would recommend in, in picking a topic. Well said, and I think we're done with the inquiry. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about my career path. Um, do, I'll do it somewhat briskly and ask Ken to do the same because apparently we have a number of questions for the Q&A at the end. Um, um, so I um, graduated from UC Davis Law School. While I was at Davis, I took every possible class I could related to the entertainment business, copyright, trademark, and I would definitely recommend that all of you, uh, whatever the offerings are, you know, avail yourself of those. Um, some people do internships. I didn't have that opportunity, but I would recommend that. Um, I did law review, which was, I think, really helpful in making me a really strong writer, so I, I don't regret that. Um, 
I actually, uh, as a 2L, I was looking for a law firm, which would let me know about all the different areas of practice because I wasn't sure what lawyers actually did. So I was lucky enough to be hired at Manat, Phelps and Phillips for my 2L summer, where I was exposed to all the different departments, but I was hoping that I would bond with the music lawyers there and I was lucky enough to have that happen. Um, then I did a Ninth Circuit clerkship after graduation and I don't regret that because again, it's, it helps me get in a judge's head. So for example, when you're talking about infringement, I really do feel like I understand how a judge would look at you know, an individual case and, and, and analyze it. Um, then I went back to Manat, did a bit of litigation and that has been invaluable to me throughout my practice, having that background. For example, I was representing Guns N' Roses and they had riots and they had all kinds of ensuing litigation related to the riots. And I knew, I knew what to do to, to oversee the litigation. Um, so uh, I was at Manat for a long time. Then I was at a, a music boutique firm called Davis Shapiro. And now I'm at King Holmes uh, where I'm a, one of the name partners. Um, and um, it's a really great small um, firm that has corporate and litigation so that it really now allows me as a lawyer to kind of serve as general counsel to my clients because yes, we do have to understand copyright and trademark and things like that. But we also have to understand, you know, when our client has a traffic ticket or they decide they don't like the current presidential regime and they want to move to Canada, they want immigration law advice, I either have to help them with the advice or at least help them find people to provide the advice. So I guess what I would say to you all as advice is where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, I agree with Asha that it does take a lot of hard work, but I think if you really are committed to doing music law, you can find a way in. And if you're a corporate lawyer for a while first, if you're a litigator for a while first, it'll all benefit you as, as a music lawyer in your practice. And I also just wanna say, you know, we really want as many people of as many different backgrounds as possible to join the ranks of music lawyers. So I really encourage anyone, even if you don't, again, know anything about music law, you know, um, to, to pursue it. And um, again, people of uh, you know, BIPOC background or people, um, LGBTQ people, I mean, we really want you, I mean, the, the musicians want you to be music lawyers. So I, I really encourage um, everyone to pursue, um, to pursue this line of work. Okay, Ken, um, why don't you tell us about your career path and any advice you might have? All right, thanks, Lori. Well, I went to uh, law school in Minnesota and um, they didn't have an entertainment law class then. I actually went to law school um, at following a, a career uh, in, in as being a musician and an entertainer myself. Um, I did take time off, I toured and I recorded and I uh, considered myself to be uh, an emerging, uh, an artist or entertainer. Uh, but I found out that it really wasn't my vocation, that my vocation really wasn't being an artist. My vocation really was more about counseling. And um, I had worked with some youth groups and the like when I was younger. So I had a very high pain threshold for teenagers, and uh, which turned out to be really helpful later on working with artists. Not that they're immature, but you know they're, they're passionate people. Um, as I said, there was no entertainment class I, it, in my law school. I actually wasn't looking to educate myself in that field, even though I'd been involved in the business. Um, I wanted to be a litigator, as it turned out. I was encouraged to do that because I was comfortable in front of a crowd. Um, I did take every litigation class, and I started my career out being a litigator, and I tried cases, and I did a lot of mo motion practice and jury cases, and it wasn't really befitting. I didn't really enjoy it, as it turned out, that much. I also did a lot of gritty work. Um, criminal defense work, divorce work, uh, small business work, general practice. I did trash can law. I did what I was told. And I learned a little about a lot, which really helped out. But it, it took a while before I realized that I, in order to, be, to establish an entertainment practice, which I found out I really did like, I did like working with some of the people that I grew up with in the business that started to get some traction in the Midwest and that, that I really preferred to counsel them uh, uh, legally on their career as opposed to counseling in a therapy kind of way, which is something I also had considered. Um, anyway, long story short, I had to build it uh, from Minneapolis. That means I had to, what I kept, my, my, my mantra was keep showing up and don't go home too early because it was all about networking, meeting people, and then traveling to Los Angeles and New York 
and so forth. And so I invested a lot in doing that just so I could get to know the people in, this, in the industries, many who remain very good friends to this day. So um, again, you know, it's possible to, to, to do this, uh, build a practice, I think, out of, uh, outside of the coast if you put your mind to it, although you can't do it in a vacuum. And you, really, the good news is that the music law practice um, uh, bar is actually a pretty small world of people. People like Lori and myself are in that particular lane uh, of artist advocates uh, and transactional lawyers pretty much know each other, um, uh, no matter where they might practice. If they've been in the game for a long time, if they keep showing up and don't go home too early and occupy a lane and get known in that lane and go for the long haul, uh, like uh, most successful entertainment lawyers have done, um, that's the road I took. Thanks so much, Ken, Lori. Uh, nice to hear from your about your experiences, Asha and Christopher as well. Um, so what I'm gonna do is we've got a few questions and I will answer the ones that I can answer and then I'm gonna to toss them to anyone and anyone's welcome to uh, type anything else in the chat. We have those being relayed to us and uh, for anyone on the panel here. Um, so the first question is, will it be possible to receive feedback on papers that are submitted? So we actually do have a process where a student that has submitted a paper can request feedback. So anyone's welcome to do that. We will get a hold of the graders that actually graded uh, your paper and ask them to provide that feedback. We've done that for the last couple of years. Um, second question that I can also answer is, um, how many students typically submit papers for the competition? Um, you know, for us, we'd love to see as many people take advantage of the opportunity as possible. We've seen around 70 papers most years recently. We'd love to grow it just because we'd love to make the opportunity available. But I think the, the, the good part about that, if you're thinking of entering, is you're, you know, you're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of students that you're competing against here. Um, another question that I can cover, once we have submitted a paper, but find a correction that needs to be made, could we resubmit a paper before the due date? Um, so there's nothing in our rules that preclude you from doing that, as long as you do that prior to the deadline. Um, we hope that nobody will abuse that rule and do it a million times, but yeah, that's, that's fine and we will accept that as long as it's received before the deadline. And please do make it clear if you send that in with a correction that you, you know, clearly identify you've already submitted. Um, uh, another one that I can cover, if you are currently enrolled at a law school but not studying entertainment law, could we still participate? Well, just as Ken was not studying per se entertainment law, uh, he could have submitted and yes, you can, you can absolutely submit. Uh, it's, there's no specific, you know, requirement that you're studying or taking certain courses in law school. All right, so here's one uh, for, for our group I'll toss out. It's, are there any topics to absolutely avoid when writing our paper? I don't know if uh, anyone wants to, Ken, Lori, you wanna talk about that? Ken, do you have any examples of things that people have done in the past that were not a good idea? Well, there are some, I, I will just chip in at the beginning that there are some specifics in the rules. So please do, please do read that if you're you know, interested in this part of it and read them anyway, but uh, that talk about not, uh, not writing in a disparaging way um, and obviously a respectful way and, and those kind of things. So there's some, some language in the rules about that, but topics wise, eh. No, I've seen a lot of interesting uh, papers. Um, and, the, and, and, and usually the, those that um, you shouldn't really write about. First off, I, I want to talk about the style. I mean, sarcasm, humor, and all that it has its place. It's not unwelcomed, but it shouldn't be, you know, a, it shouldn't be a caustic approach to anything. It really needs to be more measured um, and scholarly. Um, but again, as I said before, good use of language, humor, sarcasm, or whatever is, is, is welcome um, if it's done appropriately. I would just say, so I've seen papers that have gone up the rung a little bit, um, but they usually drop off uh, right away if they are uh, topics to avoid. And I think those are those, the ones to avoid are those that are void of any relevance um, or are written for a different audience. I, you know, I've, I've seen articles have been written, well, this would be good if you were a filmmaker, uh, you know, or if they just like didn't belong in this contest. Um, or that if it's a, if it's a, 
if it's written as a, a, a opinion piece, an op-ed, it doesn't belong here, you know? So uh, again, the guidelines is, should be, you know, music topic in one that's relevant and, uh, and, and then at least you're in the neighborhood. Okay. Anything to add, Lori? No, I think, but I do think you should pay attention to what Ken was saying earlier, because I think like I'm a grader and I have been a number of times and I feel like um, as a practitioner, I want things that are fresh and topical if possible. Um, so if it's something that's just really sort of dusty and old, I don't, it, it's not, it's not going to appeal to me. I mean, like Christopher's topic, I live and breathe that topic. So I really, and it, it's, it, it is difficult to take on that kind of topic because you do have to come up with a fresh approach to it. But if you can do that or what Asha did as well, because we are all about the Music Modernization Act, um, you know, in my practice, because we're having to live with implementing it. So um, definitely, I think those are the things. And Ken's advice about maybe having a practitioner give you a thought, if you can find somebody, um, because they can say, no, 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 that's been there, done that, or, oh, no, that's something that people actually, you know, are interested in. I think, I think that's um, a really good idea. Great. Okay, so I've got a question specifically for Christopher here. It says, have you compared your first submission to the ELI writing competition to your submission that ended up winning the writing competition? And if so, what was the main difference you noticed between the two? And how do you think you improved from one to the other? Uh, from my first topic, is that what my first submission? Well, I think, I think you'd mentioned that you had submitted previously yes. as a 1L. Yes. So I, I want to say too, like um, I mentioned, I, I've been lucky going to UCLA. I have a lot of, you know, entertainment law classes. But of course, I, when I applied as a one L, I'm taking one L classes. There were no entertainment law classes. You fully can do this on your own. Um, my first topic was actually when net neutrality was like a very hot topic, and so I wrote about how net neutrality was going to affect industry giants, industry industry giants. Um, and um, musicians, particularly, you know, Spotify versus SoundCloud and how those markets kind of are different and what they provide for independent artists. Um, the difference was um, I'm a much better writer than my 1L. As 1L I had just taken one semester. Um, I also rushed that paper because I spent my, my time on my studies. So I ended up not being able to finish my footnotes and properly edit. And I think that is so important because I think I had an interesting topic, but because I didn't have or allow respect the amount of time that it would take to fully formulate that topic, I kind of cheated myself out of that. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, and then also now, of course, like I didn't write about net neutrality again because it's not as relevant as, a, as a, it's not as hot as a topic right now. And I had, thought that the copyright infringement was a much more interesting and relevant topic at the time. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you. Um, so the next question I had here that's sort of a follow on to the topic discussion, this would be for anyone. It says, you mentioned that we shouldn't worry so much about the setup and should get to our point quickly. Should we assume that our, the reader is familiar with the basics of music industry copyright law, uh, for example? Let me hit that one. Yes, you should assume that you're, you're writing to a sophisticated crowd, um, that they know the basics, so that they don't, they shouldn't be grading your paper. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there, you have to set it up to the extent of identifying the problem and then, then going on to the solution. So no one can assume that, they, that what the problem is. So you have to set that out and no one can assume what your approach to the resolution will be. So you need to set that out and then, and then have at it. Great. Any other thoughts on that? I would just add that formatting is really important um, mm -hmm. and being really clear with your headings of, you know, this is the issue and this is solution number one, solution number two, solution number three, however many you, you propose. I think that helps the reader as they're going through several papers to focus in on what, what you're trying to propose. Great. Yeah, good thought. All right, I've got another uh, sort of follow on question on topic. It's a uh, question is, if there is a topic we think will be oversaturated, overly saturated, but is currently novel, do you believe it will reflect a paper negatively? I guess reflect on a paper negatively. 
I'll hit that one again because for many years you get the you know topic du jour uh, where there's a lot going on. Like the first paper, there's a whole lot going on in terms of infringement um, that year. Um, the same with Asha, you know, there was tornadic activity around the uh, the, the MM. So I think that there's, um, if you wade into those waters, you got to do it boldly because everyone knows about it and is talking about it, but it's not figured out. So if you can come in with a fresh approach or a fresh look that's not cockamamie, you know, that is practical, do it. Um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, in an earlier conversation that one year, one of the runner-ups wrote about socialized music, which is like out there, you know. But it was written in such a way, socializing music, you know, financially, that to put that in front of a group of capitalistic record companies and the like was very provocative. Uh, but it was done in a way where I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty interesting, you know, uh, and, and it made for an interesting interview. Uh, but I think that other, otherwise, you know, you don't want to pick something that no one cares about. Like, oh, you know, you mistake me for someone who cares as I'm reading this, you, you know, you <laughs> You want to, you know, you want to make it, make it interesting. Like, um, I think even like Lori was saying, like she lived in that space of, of uh, as we all do, who are, you know, full on two fisted you know, transactional lawyers for artists. You know, if someone's writing to something that you go like, wow, I, this is really helping me, or I'm really understanding this issue better, then you know, bonus, bonus points. You know, you had the right audience for your for your paper. Great. Okay, so the last question I have is, um, are foreign students eligible to enter the competition? And the answer is, that as long as a student is attending a U.S. law school on a foreign student visa, they are absolutely eligible to, uh, to enter. Um, okay, so with that, I think I'll wrap it up. I want to thank everyone for spending an hour with us that's able to join us today. Um, as I mentioned, this session has been recorded and... Uh, you know, we'll clean up a couple of audio glitches and put it back up and it will be available for uh, viewing on demand all the way through uh, when the papers are due. And uh, that will be available at grammy.com slash ELI. You'll find a link there. Um, I also, if you have any other questions along the way, you can write us at ELI at recordingacademy.com. That's our email address. Um, or any of the staff that you know here at the Recording Academy, they will get the question to us. Um, uh, one other little detail there, that is the, you can go direct to grammy.com slash ELI hyphen social to get the social graphics. And hey, if you enter the competition, you know, tweet out about it, say you entered, use the little graphic, um, you know, let students know, let share the, share the love, share the opportunity with, with your colleagues, your, your fellow students. And um, yeah, I think I, I just want to uh, thank everybody again. We'll all say uh, farewell here. Uh, um, yeah, and we all hope that you have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Remember, you don't catch fish if you don't go fishing. So please join. I encourage you to submit. Well put. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.